Good morning, venerables. How are you? Hope you are very fine indeed. Welcome to week nine of our semester. And congratulations, we've finished the first eight weeks, which means that we've finished the first half of the semester. So from today onwards, we are going into the second half, just, an, just another eight more weeks of uh, lectures, and then the semester will be over. So please keep up your hard work, your excellent work. Okay, so now welcome into lecture nine of the essence of Buddha Dharma. We are going to look at the Noble Eightfold Path Wisdom. We'll start off with uh, looking at the power of mindfulness, some words of advice from uh, Master Thich Nhat Hanh before we move on to look at the conceptual understanding of wisdom. For the first half of this lecture, we will stop somewhere in the middle of this. And then in the second half of this lecture, we will continue from conceptual wisdom to right understanding or right view, right thought or right intention and then end with some words on uh, homework and reflections five well we have talked about the four noble truths and then from then on to lecture uh, seven we've look look at morality shilla right right speech action livelihood then last week we have looked at uh, samadhi right effort right mindfulness and right concentration yeah we stopped uh, we finished everything then then we move on to take a look at Zen masters advice on um, the four immeasurable minds yeah matter meta meditation so today we will finish up lecture eight by looking at uh, Zen masters advice on mindfulness yeah the power of mindfulness and how to practice mindfulness in our daily life as we have said before um, masters buddhist masters like the dalai lama and and Thich Nhat Hanh, they have a global following and this is because they have been able to manage to present buddhist teachings of 2500 years ago uh, to suit the needs of modern people yeah so that's why we want to uh, learn from them how to uh, present the buddha's message um, to suit the needs of modern people. So we have also said that um, mental development, right? Samadhi is important for moral conduct, for the practice of moral conduct, like on this picture here. Mm -hmm. We see somebody who does ethical uh, discipline, sleeping very well. And then um, mental development is also important for the realization of wisdom yeah something which we will talk about later so if you can follow the noble eightfold path rigorously then someday we will manage to eliminate altogether the three poisons as you can see here of attachment aversion and ignorance and we will be in nibbana okay so on this note let us move on to take a look at nahan's teachings on the power of mindfulness now my right mindfulness is at the heart of the buddha's teachings it is the energy that brings us back to the present moment wonderful moment to be fully alive and fully aware it is inclusive and loving to cultivate mindfulness is to cultivate the buddha within us Looking at this picture here, we see when we are mindful, deeply in touch with the present moment, our understanding of what is going on deepens and we begin to be filled with acceptance, love, joy, acceptance, joy, peace and love. Okay, so on this note then we move on to uh, what Master Thich Nhat Hanh calls seven miracles of mindfulness by the way we are of course on lecture nine notes page one if you have notes in front of you please look at them if not it's all right just listen carefully to the powerpoint slides and you can get back to your lecture notes 
uh, to reveal them. Now, the seven miracles of mindfulness, they help us lead a happy and healthy life by transforming suffering into peace, joy, and freedom. Looking at this slide here, in mindfulness, one is not only restful and happy, but alert and awake. Meditation is not evasion. It is a serene encounter with reality. Some people may have the wrong impression that ah, when we meditate, we are wasting time, we are escaping from life, we are not doing what we should do, but this is of course uh, totally wrong, right? Meditation is like charging ourselves, uh, uh, energizing ourselves so that we can perform our duties and responsibilities in life much better. It's just like our handphone, right? Every every day or two, we need to, to charge the battery of the handphone so that it can continue to function. So the same for meditation. It is like uh, exercising for the mind, which we should do every day to make sure that both our body and mind are in top excellent condition. As such, I promise myself that I will enjoy every minute of every day that is given to me to live, to be mindful, to live in the present moment. Seven miracles. First miracle is to be able to be present and touch deeply the wonders of life, the blue sky, the flower, and the smile of our child. So it is so easy, yeah? to be able to deeply appreciate uh, every present moment. Then we will be able to see wonders in all the little things in life. Hmm? Look at this picture. Life is available only in the present moment. Ah, a butterfly, yeah? Taking pollen from a flower. If we can uh, really relish, savor every moment, we will appreciate the wonders of life in every moment. The second miracle is to make the other, the sky, the flower, our child, present also. We, our loved ones, are here together. We have the chance to see each other deeply. Okay, so the first miracle is talking about ourselves, yeah? We are able to appreciate the wonders of life. The second miracle is once we are fully present in the moment, we are also uh, giving life to our object of mindfulness. And this object can be anything, yeah? The sky, the flower, our child, anything in our environment, yeah? Our Dharma brothers, our master, uh, whoever. So when we are mindful in the present moment, it is not just us that is being present, but the object of our mindfulness is also present with us. So once uh, we can do that, then we are bringing something else, some other people, into the wonders of mindfulness as well. Okay, so take a look at this picture. Ah, to a lovely couple, right? Uh, enjoying the beach, uh, the wind, the sun. Yeah, so wonderful. The third miracle is to nourish the object of our mind. We can discover many new and wonderful things about our loved ones, their joys, talents, aspirations. So you can tell your devotees, yeah, if, if they are parents, ah, a first miracle, oh yeah, we appreciate life. Second miracle, we bring others into the appreciation of life. And third miracle, once we bring others, for instance, our loved ones, our family members, our children, we can uh, we know what they need, right? And then we can further develop them. We know all about their strengths and weaknesses and how we can build them up, yeah, to increase their joy, talents, aspirations. Hmm? And the fourth miracle is to relieve the other's suffering. Our presence is like a mantra, sacred speech that has a transforming effect. So once we're mindful, right? Ah, if we know that our loved ones or our Dharma brothers have uh, problems that they are suffering, then we will be present for them. Yeah, and then we will do, uh, we will say all the things that are necessary 
to help them. We will do all the things that are necessary that will help them. This is why uh, our presence is like a mantra. Right? A mantra is like sacred, is a sacred speech that helps us to transform our, our lives from something unwholesome to something wholesome. So look at this picture. The source of love is deep in us and we can help others realize a lot of happiness. One word, one action, one thought can reduce another person's suffering and bring that person joy. So when we're mindful, not only uh, do we find peace and happiness within ourselves, but we can also bring peace and happiness to others, to our family members, to our relatives, to our friends, to our Dharma brothers, to anybody that come into contact with us. Without doing anything, things can sometimes go more smoothly just because of our peaceful presence. In a small boat, when a storm comes, if one person remains solid and calm, others will not panic and the boat is more likely to stay afloat. So in our lives, there are many ups and downs, right? So if we can be mindful of every moment, um, including the time when we're facing challenges, when all our Dhamma brothers, when the monastery or when the family are facing challenges, um, if we can be calm and mindful, then we can help to transform the people around us, to transform the situation around us for the better. Yeah? If a storm comes and we are like everyone else, caught up in the storm and, not, and, and, uh, and caught up in the waves going up and down, then we cannot offer solutions yeah, to help overcome the situation. Hence, it is important to be uh, calm and mindful in order to help out ourselves and in order to help others. The fifth miracle, deeply shining the light of mindfulness on the other and at the same time, shining the light of mindfulness on ourselves. Okay, so this means uh, starting at one level and then going deeper and deeper into ourselves, going deeper and deeper into uh, other people, into other things. Mm -hmm. So looking at the picture here, people have a hard time letting go of their suffering. Out of a fear of the unknown, they prefer suffering that is familiar. Yeah, especially people whom we have come across who, who experience anxiety or depression or all kinds of addictions to um, smoking, to gambling, to sex whatsoever. Yeah, they are actually suffering, right? And because of their addiction, because of their craving, they are afraid to let go because they are afraid of the unknown. So if we're mindful um, of, of, of what they are undergoing and if we're mindful of the situation, we can offer solutions to help them. We must look deeply in order to see and understand the needs, aspirations and suffering of the people, of the person we love. This is the ground of real love. So again, in order to help ourselves and others, we must go deeper and deeper into ourselves and go deeper and deeper into other people, into the environment outside of ourselves. Yeah, and these two are connected. Once we go deeper and deeper into ourselves, we know how how we work, then much more easily we will be able to know how others work, others outside things and people outside us work because we are all uh, interconnected. Yeah, we all share the same characteristics, same marks of existence. The sixth miracle is to understand the very foundation of love. When we understand someone, we cannot help but love uh, him or her. Okay, so this is a, a logical development when we look deeper into ourselves and when we look deeper into others. The seventh miracle is to transform. We touch the healing and refreshing elements of life and begin to transform our own suffering and the suffering of the world. Okay, so we begin to become mindful and we go deeper at different levels, right? At different levels, we understand ourselves. At different levels, we understand others. 
So as you go deeper and deeper and deeper, we are more capable of transforming uh, more and more, right? Of our unwholesomeness to wholesomeness. Like earlier on, we talked about um, overt, uh, overt behavior, right? Transformed through our purification of uh, speech and action, and then and uh, conscious level transformed through uh, samatha, calm meditation, and then latent or unconscious level we transform through the practice of mindfulness and insight vipassana meditation. So different levels huh, as we go on. So first miracle to seven miracles all represent different levels of practice as well. So take my hand, we will walk. We will only walk. We will enjoy our walk without thinking of arriving anywhere. So savor the moment. When we walk like we are rushing, we print anxiety and sorrow on the earth. We have to walk in a way that we only print peace and serenity on the earth. Be aware of the contact between your feet and the earth. Walk as if you are kissing the earth with your feet. So says Master Thich Nhat Hanh. So everything that we do in our life, we try to be uh, gentle and mindful, right? Avoid uh, violence and um, and crude speech, action, and behavior. Okay, so from the seven miracles of mindfulness, let us take a look at what Master Thich Nhat Hanh tells us about the four foundations or the four establishments, four establishings of mindfulness. The four establishments of mindfulness are the foundation of our body. Yeah, our body means. Uh, are the foundation of our home. Our home here refers to our body and mind. When we're truly home, we will be a place of refuge for ourselves and others. We will be like a giant tree, right? Resting in the forest, very calm for ourselves, very calm for others. Well, look at the, the quotations here. Mindfulness is a kind of energy that helps us to be fully present in the here and now, aware of what is going on in our body, in our feelings, in our mind, and in the world. These are the four foundations, so that we can get in touch with the wonders of life that can nourish and heal us. Mindfulness helps us go home, go home, yeah? that means go home to our body and mind, to the present. And every time we go there and recognize a condition of happiness that we have, happiness comes. So come back to our home, come back to our body and mind, come back to the four foundations of mindfulness. So let's mindfulness of the body. Breathing, yeah, this concerns mindfulness of our breathing and of our various bodily postures. So let us be aware of our bodies Breathing in, I know I'm standing. Breathing out, I smile to my body. Breathing in, I calm my body. Breathing out, I smile. Dwelling in the present moment, I know this is a wonderful uh, moment. Okay? So, besides being aware and attentive to our breathing, mindfulness of the body also means knowing uh, A, 32 parts of the body. Here we can scan all parts of our body mindfully from the top of our head to the soles of our feet. As we scan each part, we smile to it. The love and care of this meditation can do the work of healing. So our abbot here, our very master Guang Shen, he teaches a relaxation um, and mindfulness practice to the public. And he always uh, starts off with scanning the, our body from the top of the head to the bottom of our feet to relax and to be mindful. Okay, so the benefits of body scanning improves concentration, cultivates awareness, there's a power to heal, uh, it understands how stress affects our body and it has gives us the greater capacity to listen to his wisdom. Hmm? So mindfulness of the body, be aware of our breathing, bodily postures, 
be aware of the different parts of our body by scanning the body. Now, mindfulness of the body also means four elements of the body. Like we've said last week, our body and all phenomena are consist of earth, right? Represents solidity, extension, water representing fluidity, cohesion, fire representing heat, energy, and air, wind representing motion. So breathing in, I see the earth element in me. Breathing out, I smile to the earth element in me. When we see the earth element inside and outside of us, we realize that there is no boundary between us and the rest of the universe. We are interbeing, we are interconnected, and we are everywhere. All right? So we can repeat this with the other three elements as well. Breathing in, I see the water element in me. Breathing out, I smile to the water element in me. Breathing in, I see the fire element in me. Breathing out, I smile to the fire element in me. And breathing in, I see the wind element in me. Breathing out, I smile to the wind element in me. So keeping our body healthy is an expression of gratitude to the whole cosmos, to the whole universe, the trees, the clouds, everything. For after all, we're all connected, right? We, are, we our body and mind consist of four four elements, and so uh, so is everything else outside of our body and mind. And we are here to awaken from our illusion of separateness. Okay, we're all interconnected. to mindfulness of sensations and or feeling. As we have said in the last lecture, here we are re referring to pleasants that are either, uh, we are referring to sensations or feelings that are either pleasant, unpleasant or neutral. Neutral means neither pleasant nor unpleasant. If we face our feelings with care, affection and non-violence, we can transform them into a kind of energy that is healthy and nourishing. So whatever we want to do in our practice, it is always to transform un unwholesome energies into wholesome energies. If we can do this, then we will be able to transform suffering into happiness. Yeah, we will be able to transform self-centeredness to selflessness. Hmm? So to love our enemy is impossible. The moment we understand our enemy we feel compassion towards him or her, and he or she is no longer our enemy. Yeah, remember meta meditation too? We say that uh, we should always start off cultivating love and compassion within ourselves, then radiate to um, people we know, and then radiate to people whom we do not know, strangers and enemies. Mm -hmm. So start off with ourselves, then uh, get to know others, and then we'll find that it is easier to, uh, uh, to be to do this. Mm -hmm. Then we have mind, mind or mind states or consciousness. And this means doing the presence or absence of unwholesome states of mind and of our degree of mental development and concentration as we have mentioned this last lecture. So when we embrace our states of mind, even difficult to ones like anger and, and fear, we suffer less right away and begin our healing and transformation processes. Mm -hmm. So this is uh, closely related to mindfulness of sensations and feelings, pleasant, unpleasant and neutral, and then to the unwholesome states and wholesome states in, in terms of mindfulness of the mind. So fear keeps us focused on the past or worried about the future. If we can acknowledge our fear, we can realize that right now we are okay. Right now, today, we are still alive and our bodies are working marvelously. Our eyes can still see the beautiful sky. Our ears can still hear the voices of our loved ones. So many times in life, when we are worried, when we are anxious, when we are stressed, uh, we also become fearful, right? Not knowing what is going to happen, fearful of the future, uh, whether everything will be okay. So whenever we come across such fear, we can calm ourselves and, and focus on breathing. Breathe 
as long as we have a breath, we are still alive. Then from our breath, we can look at our eyes, we can still see, we can look at our sense organs. Our sense organs are still working. Isn't that wonderful? Yeah, that despite everything uh, so challenging happening around us, we are still very much alive. And as long as we are alive, we can improve things. Yeah, we can make things better for ourselves and make things better for others. Then mindfulness of mind objects or ideas, thoughts and things, the physical and mental processes such as knowing the five aggregates, etc. So again, Master Thich Nhat Hanh reminds us, go back and take care of ourselves. Our body needs us. Our feelings need us. Our perceptions need us. Our suffering needs us to acknowledge, go home and be there for all these things. And as long as we're heading in the right direction, we're making progress. Be patient with ourselves. Act with determination. Practice diligently. Take one moment at a time. All right? So uh, whenever we have a, a, a goal, long-term goal, we can break it into small parts. Yeah? And then we'll find it more manageable. It's just like uh, do we, getting a bachelor's degree from BCS, right? Ah, if we think of it, wow, six years, so long. And, and then we sometimes may think, ah, give up, give up. But if we just enjoy every moment, okay, step by step, ah, okay, uh, now we are doing this, and then and then another day we are doing this. Slowly, slowly, time will pass by very quickly, and 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 we are enjoying every moment that we do. And before we know it, hmm, we we will be halfway through the uh, bachelor's uh, program, just like for you, right? Now you are into the third year. Half year, halfway through the six year uh, course. The four establishments of mindfulness contain everything in the universe. If we see the truth of one thing in the universe, we see the nature of the universe. Because of our mindfulness, our deep looking, the nature of the universe will reveal itself. Through my love for you, I want to express my love for the whole cosmos the whole of humanity and all beings. By living with you, I want to learn to love everyone and all species. If I succeed in loving you, I will be able to love everyone and all species on earth. This is the real message of love. Okay, we start off by being mindful of ourselves, our body and mind, yeah, our home. And then from there on, the more, the deeper and deeper we understand ourselves, the deeper and deeper we will also understand others and the whole universe yeah because we are all interconnected we are all uh, into being so this is what we mean all right when we talk about the four establishments of mindfulness containing everything in the universe okay now let's move on to mindfulness is the buddha When we practice mindfulness, we generate the energy of the Buddha within us and around us. And this is the energy that can save the world. We use our Buddha eyes to see with the energy of mindfulness, with insight and understanding. When we listen with our Buddha, Buddha ears, we can restore communication and relieve a lot of suffering. When we put the energy of mindfulness into our hands, our Buddha hands can change the world and bring happiness to many people. Okay, so using our Buddha eyes, listening with our Buddha ears, using our Buddha hands, uh, this will benefit ourselves and others. It's just like Bodhisattva Kuan Yin, right? Uh, listening to the look, looking at the suffering of people, listening to the cries, and then with with uh, uh, the Bodhisattva's thousand hands helping others, okay? Well, the capacity of waking up, of being aware of what is going on in our feelings, in our body, in our perceptions in the world is called Buddha nature, the, capac the capacity of understanding and loving. So whenever we come home to our body and mind, whenever we come home to the four foundations of uh, uh, of uh, Mindfulness, we are coming back into 
our own Buddha nature within us. All of us have our Buddha nature. It is now, uh, put, we have this potential. Once we realize the Buddha nature, we have the potential uh, to become a Buddha. Hence the capacity of understanding and loving. In short, when we practice mindfulness, we're in contact with life. We can offer our love and compassion to lessen suffering and bring joy and happiness. Therefore, do not lose ourselves in the past or in the future or in our anger, worries of So, every minute we spend worrying about the future and regretting the past is a minute we miss in our appointment with life, a missed opportunity to engage life and to see that each moment gives us a chance to change for the better, to experience peace and joy. Okay, so don't worry about the past, what's past is past. Don't worry about the future, the future is not here. As long as we focus on the present every moment, uh, our future will take care of itself. So come back to the present moment and touch life deeply. We can generate the heart, the energy of mindfulness in each moment of our life. We can enter the heart of the Buddha. So, body, speech and mind, in perfect oneness. I send my heart along with the sound of the bell. May the hearers awaken from forgetfulness and transcend all anxiety and sorrow. So, if every moment we are fully into the moment, uh, we know exactly what uh, our body, speech and mind is going on, then everything that we do will be filled with wonders. Yeah, will be filled with wholesomeness, will be filled with purity, will be filled with Buddha nature. And this can help ourselves and others transcend unwholesomeness, anxiety and sorrow. We will hence be walking, entering the heart of the Buddha. Well, let us then move on to wisdom. Right? We have finished uh, morality and mental development and this is the last uh, uh, aspect of wisdom. Now, wisdom is described as the understanding of such realities as the Four Noble Truths, Interdependent Origination and the Three Universal Characteristics. The attainment of wisdom refers to the transformation of these doctrinal items from mere books of, from mere objects of book learning or intellectual knowledge into real personal experience, actual living truth. This goal is accomplished through the cultivation of good conduct and mental development. Okay, so first of all, we understand the theory of uh, the, the Noble Eightfold Path, of the Noble Truths of, of, of Buddhist teachings. Right? We understand the theory. We have a knowledge, uh, intellectual knowledge of, of, Buddhist, of Buddhist teachings. And then we practice and once we practice, then we will realize the truth of the teachings. When we realize the truth of the teachings, we are moving in the direction of uh, wisdom. Okay, so good conduct, mental development are essential in helping us move towards the practice and realization of wisdom. Okay, so we begin with theory of three universal truths, four noble truths. Uh, uh, truths, three universal characteristics, right? Three marks of existence, four noble truths, eightfold path, and then once we practice, ah, ultimately we will attain nirvana. So, right understanding here refers to the direct and immediate understanding. In some religions, faith is paramount. That means faith is the most important. In other traditions, meditation is supreme. Um, yeah, but in Buddhism, faith is preliminary. The starting point, the foundation, meditation is instrumental, it is a means, yeah, and wisdom is the heart of Buddhism, the key to the realization of the goal of Buddhism. So we do good conduct, morality, we practice mental development, calmness and mindfulness meditation, and all this is to help us reach the goal of Buddhism, the final goal of Buddhism, and that is Nirvana. Said, on life's journey, faith is nourishment. Virtuous deeds are a shelter. Wisdom is the light by day, and right mindfulness is the protection by night. 
If a man lives a pure life, nothing can destroy him. Hmm? So here, faith is important. A virtuous this refers to morality, ethical behavior. It is important. Uh, wisdom, yeah, uh, is important, and right mindfulness, uh, of course, is also important, right? So if you can do all these things, basically, ethical conduct, mental development, and cultivate wisdom, then we're leading a pure life, and nothing can destroy us. Two steps of the noble eightfold path are included. The two steps of the two steps of the noble eightfold path are included in the wisdom group, and these two are right understanding or right view, and right thought or right intention. Yeah. So take a look at this chart. Again, we've covered um, morality and concentration on mental development. Now we are on wisdom. After coming the mind, the meditation on the development of insight and wisdom. Insight meditation aims at understanding three aspects of the nature of things, that they are impermanent and unstable, anicca, that they are unsatisfactory and imperfect, dukkha, and that they are not self, anatta. It aims at realizing the four noble truths, the direct seeing of suffering, its cause, its cessation, and the path leading to its cessation okay so we begin at our meditation calm our mind uh, practice uh, samatha and then uh, go on to mindfulness and then as you go deeper we will gain insights when we go deeper and deeper into vipassana meditation okay and as we go deeper and deeper we will understand the so-called three universal characteristics or the three marks of existence yeah uh, dukkha suffering we are joined together in our mutual hardships that arise through the natural cause of living anicca impermanence nothing stays the same from moment to moment and anatta not self experience is embedded within a larger context and perceptions of ourselves as separate and independent from this context are an illusion we'll be talking about these three marks of existence in our next lecture Now, as to when a meditator turns to insight meditation, it is not. There are three basic approaches. The meditator practices at least until excess uh, concent concentration or the jhanas before turning to the development of insight. Okay, now we, we practice calm and insight. Now, how, how long should we practice come before we move into insight? Ah, ah, there are different ways of doing so, right? The first one is to practice uh, samatha meditation, calmness meditation, until we reach uh, excess concentration or jhanas. Yeah, like what we said before last uh, lecture. That's one approach. And if you're familiar, master pak aus, yeah? venerable pak aus, and venerable, uh, venerable pak aus is a Buddhist master from Myanmar, very famous. And bhikkhu buddha Dao, Buddha Dasa, um, a very famous ma Buddhist master from uh, Thailand, they would recommend practicing until at least excess concentration before moving into insight meditation. The second approach is, is that the meditator attempts to cultivate insight with only some calmness below excess concentration. So the second approach is just to have some uh, calmness, yeah? practice for a while, and then once we think that our mind is quite stable, we can go into insight uh, meditation. So this is like um, Goenka method. Yeah, If you are familiar with Goenka, again, another very famous meditation mas master, his approach is uh, within a practice, let's say within a day of practice, one third is devoted to calmness meditation, and then two third to insight uh, meditation. So if it's a 10 day retreat, the first three and a half days will be devoted to samatha meditation and then the remaining six and a half days to uh, mindfulness and going into insight uh, meditation. And the third approach is that the meditator attempts to cultivate insight without calmness. This is known as the dry or bare insight meditation. 
So this, this third approach says that, oh, no need to practice samatha, right? Straight away, go into mindfulness. As you go deeper and deeper into mindfulness, mindfulness and calmness will, will, will emerge and then we can go into insight meditation. So the, the famous yeah, Myanmar Buddhist masters, meditation masters, for example, Mahasi. Yeah, the Mahasi method is this way, straight away, um, mindfulness and insight. The Shui Umin method uh, is also this way, okay, straight away, mindfulness and then insight. Now, like calm meditation, insight meditation can also be explained in terms of various stages. Buddha Gosa's Visuddhimagga path of purification in the Theravadin tradition uh, teaches us, uh, uh, explains, elaborates with a system of seven purifications, Visuddhi, and a series of eight knowledges. So last lecture when we talk about Samatha or calm meditation, you know, we talk about various stages, yeah? Mm, access concentration and then the four, uh, the four jhanas. So when we talk about inside meditation, we can also break them into uh, uh, stages. So here we can uh, uh, look at Buddha Gosa's Vidusimaga, path of purification, in which he talks about this uh, uh, path of wisdom in terms of seven purifications, Visuddhi and eight uh, knowledges. So let's just take a look at each of these purifications uh, and knowledges one by one. Now, in the system of purifications, the first two purifications, referring to the purification of conduct and purification of mind or consciousness, are concerned respectively with good conduct and the practice of calm meditation. These two purifications are seen as the roots for the five purifications from third to seventh directly concerned with insight. So, in the Buddha Gosa's uh, system of seven purifications, the first two refers to purification of conduct, right? Our morality and the purification of our mind. So it is like the Noble Eightfold Path. Huh? We start off with purifying morality, right? And then we move on to uh, purify our mind in terms of mental development, okay? So the first purification of Buddha Gosa refers to purification of morality, uh, as in this Noble Eightfold Path. And then the second purification of, of mind refers to a uh, mental development, the, uh, the, the second tripod of the Noble Eightfold Path. And then once we have these two, we move on to insight meditation. In number three, purification of view. This is also referred to as the analysis of formations. No person or being is seen apart from changing mental and physical uh, phenomena. The meditator is concerned with breaking down his sense of a substantial self. He contemplates experiences in terms of the five aggregates or the six senses and their respective objects. And the purpose is to impress upon the mind that when we look at any particular experience, what we find is not a substantial person or being, but just mind and body, independence upon each other. All right, so to repeat, we start off purifying our morality, first purification, then we purify our mind, um, uh, mental development, that's the second purification. And then as we go deeper and deeper, right, we're moving into insight uh, meditation, then we come to this stage of purification of you. As we move deeper and deeper, we will start, we will see, hey, there's nothing uh, like this body, right? There's nothing like this self, yeah? That what we have is actually mind and body just function together. And then when we break mind and body, ah, they are even uh, uh, made up of smaller things. So just look at this chart, right? Our body and mind is made up of form, which is body, and then mind, which consists of sensation, perception, formation, and consciousness. So we think that we are one solid uh, body, but actually it is not. 
we our body just consists our self just consists of body and mind and then our form right our body can be broken down further yeah? we we have our internal sense base our eye ear nose tongue and body and then with this sense organs this sense base we can perceive our external sense base yeah for eyes we can have visible form ear we have sound nose we experience smell tongue we experience taste and then body we experience touch and then if we break them even further yeah according to abhidhamma the ultimate reality is actually 28 material phenomena okay so as we go deeper and deeper into inside med meditation we move from seeing ourselves as one permanent substantial self we break it into uh, a mind and, and body and then this is further broken down into um, internal external sense basis and then the ultimate uh, reality all right so similarly for our mind we talk about mental objects abhidhamma tells us that there are 52 mental factors and then uh, we have consciousness we have nibbana all right so this is the stages of going deeper and deeper uh, experiencing mind and body then stage four we come to purification by crossing over doubt this is also referred to as comprehension of conditions and it is insights into interdependent origination cause and effect the tendency to think of a non-changing eye continuing over time starts to wane the meditator now broadens the meditation to take in the past present and future he begins to see that what is in operation is a universal law the law of dependent condition arising just as body and mind are interdependent now in the present so they have been in the past and so they must be in the future he sees that mind and body have not been created by some creator god thus there is no particular beginning to their existence and no end reality is seen to be rapidly renewed every moment as a stream of fluxing unsatisfactory dharmas okay so when we experience mind and body no no longer an, uh, a solid self then the next stage that we experience when we do our inside meditation is to cross over doubt yeah to understand conditions to understand that everything is a matter of cause and effect that everything is interdependent origination we will have a separate lecture on interdependent origination yeah as we understand that everything is in is as is interconnected then our view of our solid self right unchanging self will diminish uh, further and then when we experience this in the present we will also get to understand that in the past it is also the same and in the future it is also the same that there is no permanent self right just like the self that we're experiencing now is mind and body uh, uh, changing uh, dharmas all the time they're changing all the time in the past it is also like that in the future it is also it will also be like that so if you take a look at this um this chart it represents interdependent um uh, origination the outside represent the the 12 aspects of interdependent uh, origination they're all connected and then the inner one okay we'll see that from past causes give rise to present effect and then from present uh, causes will give rise to future effects yeah so the past the present the future they are all uh, interconnected we will understand that yes everything is actually changing all the time everything is in flux yeah everything the, all the phenomena in the world in us are always changing hmm? no permanent self and because of this uh, there is no uh satisfact there's no uh, satisfaction there is no permanent happiness yeah we have dukkha we have dissatisfaction we have suffering direct insight into this process of cause effect what deeply affects the meditator profoundly changes his 
outlook of the world. His understanding of the teaching then ceases to be purely theoretical. Now it is a matter of direct experience. He is said to cross over doubt and thereby complete the fourth purification to become a lesser attainer of the stream. All right. So when he reaches this stage, yeah, when he begins to understand yeah, aspects of interdependent origination, he is walking uh, uh, further and further onto the noble path, right? He is crossing over doubt. He's no, uh, long, he no longer has any doubts, any uncertainty about the Buddha's teachings, right? At first, all of us begin by learning the theoretical knowledge, the academic aspects of it, the intellectual aspects of it. Then as we practice insight meditation, as we experience mind and body, as we experience a cause and effect, then we have no longer doubt that the, uh, what we learn in theory is actually mm, uh, confirmed in practice. So when we complete this fourth purification, we become uh, just on the verge of going into the noble path, right? So lesser attainer of the stream. Going into the stream means going to the uh, noble path. Purification is by knowing and seeing what is the path and what is not the path. The meditator proceeds to the contemplation of rise and fall. He now moves on to a deeper level of insight practice, contemplates the world as making up of as made up of phenomena that are all alike, impermanent, suffering, and not self. These are the three universal characteristics, the three marks of existence. So once he goes into this stage of insight meditation, fifth stage, ah, he will see a uh, rise and fall. Everything is rising and falling. He begins to experience directly a world made up not of substantial permanent beings or objects, but of patterns of events rising and falling, coming into existence and passing out of existence, like dew drops at sunrise, like a bubble on water, like a line drawn on wa uh, water, like a flash of lightning. Things in themselves lack substance, always eluding one's grasp, like a mirage, a conjuring trick, a dream, the circle formed by a whirling firebrand, a fairy city foam or the trunk of a banana. Okay, so this is one of the uh, uh, analogies used. Everything is like a dream, like a uh, illusion, like uh, bubbles, right? So the world is just like bubbles, up and down, uh, uh, changing uh, uh, all the time. Nothing permanent, nothing substantial. Everything is rising and falling. Now this experience is profound, peaceful, and the mind begins to settle into a state of peace close to a jhana, and it is characterized by ten qualities: illumination, knowledge, joy, tranquility, happiness, commitment, resolve, alertness, equanimity, and significantly, attachment. Because of the presence of attachment. These ten qualities are collectively referred to as the ten defilements of insight. Okay, so again, we practice morality, we practice uh, samatha meditation, we go into mindfulness uh, meditation. As we go deeper, we go into insights. Yeah, a, a, a purification stage number three, we will be able to experience mind and body. Uh, purification number four, we will be able to experience cause and effect. And purification number five. Now we will be able to experience rise and fall. Everything is just rising and falling. And when we and when we experience this stage, our mind becomes even more peaceful. And we have ten qualities, yeah, as mentioned in this paragraph. Mm -hmm. uh, ten insights. Now, because during this stage we still have attachment, yeah, because of this element of attachment, all these insights, all these uh, qualities are defiled. That's why we call them the ten defilements of insight. Yeah, even though they may be joy, tranquility, uh, happiness, but because it comes along with attachment, and hence they are still uh, defilements. The ten defilements of insight. Being so deeply affected by this experience, 
the mind grasps at it and takes it wrongly to be awakening itself. The meditator mistakenly concludes that he has reached the end of the path, that he has attained a nirvana. Yeah, so this experience, because it is so peaceful, so if the meditator in this stage of his meditation is not careful, he thinks that because he has reached such a level of peace that he has achieved nirvana. But actually, he still has not achieved a nirvana, right? Because of his 10 defilements of insight, because of the presence of uh, attachment. Then how does he know that uh, he's, he's actually not in nirvana? Ah, only when some experience, like the arising of strong anger or fear, dissuades him, stops him from this view, does he complete the fifth purification of knowing and seeing what is the path and not the path. Once this pseudo-nirvana is recognized, the ten states can then be contemplated as having the three marks, so that attachment to them gradually passes. So if somebody experienced this peace, right? Ah, and thinks that he is in uh, nirvana, then how does he know that he's not in nirvana? Ah, so he, I say, carry on in his daily life. And then suddenly when he come across very strong, strong uh, states of unwholesome mind, yeah, like anger, okay, or like he's, uh, 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 he, he still has some hate for somebody, yeah, then he knows that he's not in nirvana because nirvana means the total elimination of the three poisons of greed, anger, and delusion. Ah, once he realizes that he's not in nirvana, then he knows, okay, the purification of, of knowing and seeing what is the path and what is not the path. So previously when he thought he was uh, in nirvana, he was actually in pseudo nirvana. Pseudo means fake, <coughs> so fake nirvana. So he's, then he knows that, ah, that is not the path. And that he still has some way to go in the stage of insight meditation. So once he realized that that is not the path, that that is fake or pseudo nirvana, then he slowly goes on. Yeah, he's, he contemplates further, he moves on further, and then he, once he can see that there's no more attachment to the 10 insights earlier on, yeah, the insights of illumination, knowledge, joy, tranquility, uh, happiness, commitment, resolve, alertness, equanimity, then he knows that he is back on the right path again. And this will leave him with two more uh, stages, stages number six and, and, and seven. So before we go into stage six and stage seven, let us uh, take a break. Yeah, have a short break to recharge yourself before we move on to the second half of this lecture. Mm, thank you. Take a break. <laughs> 